This is Jordan's Cocktail Hour, and I'm your host, Jordan Soul. This is a show for, about, and by LGBT asylum seekers and refugees in the Netherlands, made by COC Lindbergh. COC is our national LGBT rights organization, and Cocktail is the name of our project for this very special group of newcomers, who I like to refer to as family. However, anyone else who wants to join us is welcome. So, family, welcome to our show. For the moment, we are back with weekly episodes after our break due to the corona rules and in a corona-proof setting. Crazy times, but we're here and we're able to make a show for you, and that's what counts the most. So, today from Eindhoven, my guest host is back, my amiga Scott. Our spotlight today is on our special transgender group, and our very special guests will be two amazing women. First, from Amsterdam, activist Alejandra Ortiz and our gorgeous group member Natsumi. And, as usual, Sandro Cortecas with a short update from LGBT Assam Support. Let's get started. Okay, and welcome already to our fourth episode of Jordan's Cocktail Hour. I always forget to say the name. <laughs> yes. um, uh, it's going by really, really fast, but you know, Yeah. what can I say? It's a good thing. Um, I wanted today to talk about... Our we, don't, we are not sure if it's a podcast uh youtube channel yeah yeah the thing is we kind of come up with an idea and then we evolve into something yeah. completely different a little bit of everything yeah it's <laughs> finales yeah it's finales um so uh because we have so many different layers in our group you know we say lgbt iq plus whatever yeah. i always find that this group has even layers within those layers um but the group that i always find has the most trouble and is maybe the most vulnerable not to take any power away from yeah. anybody is our transgender community um we have so many uh, people in our group who are coming from so many different countries that are transgender and um so i thought it would be good to highlight the episode uh, and put the spotlight on them yeah just like we did with our parties yeah and i think it's very important not only for the group and for them but also for everyone to doesn't know anything about what's to be transgender and that they are also like part of the society and many people doesn't know anything about it so I think it's really important to talk about yes and also because we have so many layers and so many people within our community yeah. from so many countries and cultures that there is extra stuff uh, to talk about yes um, so one of the first people that I actually met when I started uh, 500 years ago yeah. <laughs> uh, was uh, Alejandra Okay. And uh, at the time she was in uh, an AZC Echt. And AZC Echt was really the start of what we, we, we are doing now. Okay. Um, because that's where we connected with this group. And from there on, we went from six people to 30 people to 350 people. So she actually contacted you? Uh, no, I met her in the AZC. Oh, okay. Um, when I went there to meet some other people. Okay. Uh, and it was a really big group uh, at the time in AZC Echt. And uh, I thought... Um, it would be impossible to do this podcast and not include Alejandra because you know yeah she was there from the beginning she was also at the door for our parties for a very long yeah. time and uh, she put in a lot of hours to make what we're doing yeah. now a really I think big that was success. the first time I met her at your party and I saw her at the door yes so yeah. um, let's look at the interview we did with her first okay. let's check it out yes yes okay um, I wanted to invite someone really super special onto uh, today's show um, Alejandra has been kind of uh, at the very beginning of everything that we do. And uh, since I met Alejandra, she's become an amazing star, a rising star in the LGBT world in Amsterdam. And we wanted to bring her on today because we, we feel like we have to catch up and also to find out uh, about the great work she's doing in the community. Hola Alejandra, ¿cómo estás? Hola hermoso, ¿cómo estás? Bien, bien. Lista, contenta, emocionada. How is life going? Very good, very cold. Even though today is not cold because it isn't, but um, I'm in bed because, and I have this, like like an old lady, I have this cover <laughs> with uh, electric thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I know. <laughs> so I have it on. Uh, yeah, so good, cold, uh, yes. content, full of projects. I think that um, some of the people that are watching that have been with us also for a really long time will remember you uh, from a long time ago when even I think with this flag that's behind us, you were, uh, you know, the person at the door to check everybody in 
uh, at our party, uh, as we like to refer to you uh, as a, our door bitch. <laughs> door bitch, yes. <laughs> But really, it's a tough word. Yeah, it's a tough word. But in, in like, a, I, I, I took it with great honor. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was given with love, not in any kind of yeah. way. But I, I'm, I mean, that doesn't even do you justice because of you know how far you've come in this uh, this time since we first started four or five years ago. Um, but um, so, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing these days in Amsterdam that that is uh, generally focused on the transgender community? Correct. Um, I've been living in Amsterdam since 2000, May 2018. Before that, I was living really close to you, and we used to do our monthly thing together. Uh, but now, you know, I am I I've been in Amsterdam since 2018, and I've been working with um, mostly trans uh, empowerment organizations to do projects, uh, again, to, to help the trans community on, on different topics. Um, I think the longest project that I've been doing since I'm here is uh, the Trans Clinic with Trans United Europe. Trans United Europe is a um, bicultural uh, Dutch organization. Uh, it, it actually started around 10 years ago with um, COC Amsterdam, and later it became its own thing. And um, every month we have a clinic in which we, a doctor from the trans community provides hormones for uh, trans men and trans women who either cannot have access to, to them because uh, whatever reason, undocumented or uh, or don't have an insurance, or also people that uh, are already on the waiting list for the for the view here in Amsterdam. But the waiting list at the VMC is uh, two years, and that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of time to wait for for hormones and for for you to to start feeling and start looking the way you feel inside. So we provide that. We also provide uh, uh, workshops, different kind of workshops throughout the year for self-defense, for makeup. We did one for um, voguing, which mm -hmm. it, voguing might be very familiar to you, Jordan. <laughs> uh, so we, we did that. And um, now during the previous, uh, the, uh, during the first lockdown in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, Many people, many in the trans community are sex workers uh, because lack of access to resources, lack of access to uh, any other kind of uh, job, uh, this due to stigma and, and you name it. So during the previous lockdown, uh, many uh, trans sex workers found themselves with no money to even buy food. And we did a campaign in which we raised along with other two organizations, more than 10,000 euros to provide money for, for sex workers, for cis sex workers and for trans sex workers. And we uh, helped a lot of people during a period of three months. So we've been doing that with Trans United. And I, I have also been active with um, Trans Screen Film Festival. This is, uh, again, the name says us, a, a festival with, uh, organized by trans people with a trans thematic, with movies from all around the world. And I've been with them for two years now. We are currently preparing the new edition in May, which more than likely will be online due to the current COVID uh, restrictions. And I, also for two years been uh, working with uh, Pride Amsterdam, Amsterdam Pride, it, as part of the Trans Pride Commission. I mean, I, I, I am very niche, I'm staying yeah. in, in the trans community. You're basically and, everywhere there. But Alejandra, how do you guys like that during this pandemic? So how do you keep the contact with all of you guys? Like the, the transgender community? 
Well, like, we, have have, we have, yes, we haven't been able to have meetings. We have a, a trans uh, safe space in Amsterdam, the tea house, trans house. But uh, during the previous lockdown, we had to close it. Now we have it open, but with this limited space for three or four people. Now, because of the, the measurements that were announced th this week, I'm not even sure we will be able to have it open. I hope we do. So we've been doing uh, contact with the community this way by having a small numbers of people coming to the trans house and also by organizing things online in, during Christmas. Over the previous years, we organized these big parties for, for the community where people will come and will sing karaoke and, and make fools of ourselves because I sing horrible, but I still, I still sing. So, um, and we did this event online. So everybody had a camera and we were eating and singing. But I can tell you it's been challenging because, uh, yeah, I mean, as LGBTQI communities, many times we are already isolated, especially, uh, you know, those living in refugee camps or even 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 status holders because the majority of us don't have family here. So it has been challenging and I, I still think we have a lot to do, but um, yeah. I think I, that a big reason why we chose to make this podcast is because uh, there is that kind of separation, loneliness, everybody's just alone a lot. And we didn't really know how to reach everybody that this is a way to communicate at least a little bit and uh, also to see the faces and to connect with yeah. people. But, um, you know, I'm really so super impressed with like everything that you have accomplished in the last uh, few years. Uh, and, you know, like everybody, uh, no one else that how it is to be in one of those centers. So what would you advise somebody who has just come to the Netherlands as a transgender person? and is stuck in an azitse and doesn't know where to begin or where to start? Um, well, I was in that situation. I was in an azitse and... What I would advise them is to go online and look for, for groups in your area. Of course, this doesn't mean you can connect with everybody, right? There has to be the right chemistry. But I do think um, it's very important if you if you live in an SSA, if you are a trans refugee, if you are a gay refugee, if you are a, a lesbian refugee, do not stay indoors. To try to uh, to try to go out as much as possible when possible. Of course, we know now it is super challenging, but whenever this thing is over, because let's keep hoping it's gonna be over. Uh, to try to find online groups and to try them all, huh? because you might not enjoy this group or you might not feel comfortable in this other group. But uh, personally, what I did, <laughs> you know me, I went to all the groups available. <laughs> I, 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 I took every opportunity to go out in, in Utrecht, in, uh, in Doven, in Amsterdam, and... And not, it's because it's not just about the groups, but the people that you meet in those groups. Yes. Sometimes, yes, it's, you know, the reason I actually met the community in Amsterdam is because a, a, a friend of mine, Dan, you, you, I think you know her, Jessica. Yes. Uh, Jessica invited me to come to this group for uh, trans sex workers in Amsterdam. And I said to her, well, I did sex work, but I'm not a sex worker now. And she says, oh, no problem, just come. So I went there and then I started meeting other people. And next thing you know, I I meet everybody in Amsterdam. I mean, so yeah. I, keep, keep, keep on going, keep on moving. Yes. Um, for the people who doesn't know, like all of those meetings are for free. And do they have a possibility to get like a train ticket or something, some help to get there? That's a very good point. Uh, I'm not sure because NS has been more and more restrictive 
throughout the years. I'm telling you, when I first came to the Netherlands, you could travel around the country for seven euros. Yes. Seven euros. <laughs> That's how I we started, yes. No, I can't believe that. That's a new for yes. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So that's how like the project with Jordan started. We will get like what 200 tickets, right? <laughs> for seven so people euros. will yes, for seven euros. So and and people will, will travel from Groningen and you name it, everywhere. Now, this is very important. I think uh, some organizations have the funds to pay for, for your train ticket or for your transportation ticket. Not all of them, but there's something I learned through in, in that in this community and in these uh, settings, there will always be someone willing to help you with a train ticket. I mean, in the end, just put it on Facebook, which is, that's what I do when someone asks me, oh, I need hormones and I don't know how to get them. I just put it on Facebook. Hey, don't, someone has hormones and someone will bring them. Or someone says to me, I, don't, I want to go to Amsterdam, but I have no place to go to stay, to spend the night. And I just put it on Facebook and someone says, oh, I have an extra couch, extra room. And same thing with money for tickets. Uh, I think Jordan and I had this discussion that, uh, <laughs> we are very good at raising money for for projects right so so i i think uh even if you are in, let, let's say you are an SSA, you want to go out i do think if you message organizations at one point one will say we can provide you with a ticket yeah so I think, I think that if it's it's really uh someone new and it needs really help that they'll make it happen of course now Everything is all weird and strange, and we are living in a whole yeah. other time than when we first started with this. It was really much easier, but hopefully, like you said, once this is over, we can get back to business and those kinds of things will be easy. What, one of the, the parts of my question before was also, if you're in the asset say, like, what do you do uh, to get your help in the asset say? Can you go to the doctor in that uh, center and ask them for the beginning, the start of hormone, whatever it is that you need? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it has been my experience in the in the SSA that doctors are overwhelmed, and they are. Is, I'm not gonna talk bad about COA or SSA because in the end they are there to provide a certain service, and they do uh, basic. And uh, and compared to how refugees live in Mexico or Greece or whatever. I do think in the Netherlands, asylum seekers have it good. So, um, in uh, to get psychological help, I think you can get it in SSA, but you have to be very persistent. For whoever is listening to this and you are a newcomer, this is something that I learned in the Netherlands. You have to be very persistent. <laughs> keep on knocking, keep on knocking, keep on knocking. Everything. With your kids, for everything. with the health insurance, with everything. Yes. Just yes. keep it up. For sure. Yes. No, it's true. Yes. Because yeah. if you push hard enough, you'll get it. And otherwise, yeah. they will just give you a paracetamol at the doctors and yeah. say, like, come back, you know, when you Don't when be you're ashamed. Dying. No. Because yes. sometimes we have that, like, we are ashamed to put it out, to ask for a train ticket, to ask for doctor help. What whatever. I also think in this area, what we're talking about is super important to know is that uh, if you ask for psychological help when you're still in the center, you will receive it actually fairly soon is my experience. But once you get your status and you're out in the real world like and you are considered like a Dutch person, the waiting lists are endless for psychologic, uh, psychiatric help. So I always recommend yeah. people that if you feel that you need any kind of help, you know, even for depression or whatever, do it while you're still in the center uh, because that part is taken care of a lot better than when you are out because, uh, well, it's a whole nother show to, to, to explain the healthcare system here, but it's, uh, it's important you do it when you're still there. Correct, correct. And on, uh, on that note, I have two points. Uh, number one, yes, if you get psychological help while you are in the SSA, once you are out, it will continue. Yes, yes, exactly. It will continue. It, and it really is much easier uh, this way because yeah, when you are uh, out of the ASSA, then 
there will be new set a new set of requirements and an endless waiting list. So yeah, do that if, if you if you have a, a mental problem and don't be ashamed. Huh? Many many of us in the community struggle with depression or struggle with uh, any kind of uh, mental disorder, and it's okay to get help. Many times where we come from, uh, looking for for mental assistance is like how do you say in English frowned upon. Yes. 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 Yeah. But. Uh, but here is there is available and doctors may are living out of this. So do, do take advantage of that. The other thing is hormones. Uh, when I first arrived in the ACC, uh, it was very difficult for trans persons to get hormones. Very difficult. Uh, then thanks to a friend of mine, uh, we did a campaign with TNN, Transgender Net Network Netherlands. Uh, and uh, we had some kind of concession, I don't know how you call it in English, from the government, in which doctors now should be able to provide hormones for, for asylum seekers. So if you took hormones in your country, uh, oh, I hope no one from the government is seeing this because I'm gonna say something horrible. So if you took hormones in your country, tell it to the doctor and, and, and ask until you get them because you will get them. If you did not take hormones in your country, you can also say that. You can say that you took them, huh? <laughs> right. Yeah, because if you took them before, the doctor is obliged to continue them. So, yes. It's kind of like the same advice we gave before. Like, you just have to really push to get your point across with yeah. doctors here. Uh, but eventually, yeah. you'll get what you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, precise. Well, anyway, we are uh, kind of uh, finished with our time. I think that if we focused on it, we could probably talk for three hours yeah, with you because absolutely. we have still many more. Maybe one time we'll just bring you back and continue talking because there's many more things that I would love to have you on for to, you know, with your experience and uh, background is amazing. So I would love to, to talk more. And next time that we talk, I would like to talk about education on gender and identity because I think uh, many, even in our community, confuse these terms. And if we know what they are, which they are not fixed terms, but if we know what they are, then we will be able to understand ourselves better. So that's one thing. And the other thing is uh, we have a, a collective of trans refugees and trans asylum seekers called Papaya Queer. And if you are a non-refugee and non-asylum seeking person watching this, we are taking donations. You can go to our page on Facebook and make a donation. Any, every penny, every peso counts, okay? Awesome. We're definitely going to also put that information in here so people can, uh, can go right there and give you all the money that they have because I believe you deserve that. I know it's in good hands there. Um, Alejandro, I want to just thank you for everything. Muchas gracias, Alejandra. Yes. Gracias, amores. <laughs> we love you and we adore you and we uh, will talk to you again soon. It was very nice to see you. Yes. Ciao, ciao. Likewise. Take care. Adios. Sayonara. Merhaba. Okay, so that was uh, our interview with Alejandra. Yeah, it was nice to see her. You know, what I think is really interesting is that uh, what we can do is because we've been doing this for so many years, we can show the progress that people can make. And the things that can happen, uh, because I know that it's uh, really difficult to be in an as I'd say for months yeah. and months and not know where you're gonna go. And people has to understand, like, like the process is not only how you grow up, like how you build it up in this country. It's also about your how the way you look, which is really important for the transgender group. Yes. So it's also fascinating to see that. Yes. Uh, most of uh, the people in this group have come a long way, and Alejandra to me is a big example of how far you can go. The things she's doing in Amsterdam are really amazing. Um, yeah, to have contact with all of those organizations, to fight for, to stay here, to fight for her identity and everything is just really nice to see. And helping, helping a lot of people you yeah. know, with the clinic and all that stuff and all those organizations. She's a superstar. Yeah. <laughs> and we love that. Um, so that brings us actually to our next superstar. Okay. <laughs> because uh, I would like to show the interview we did with yeah. Natsumi. Um, our South American 
transgender of the group as yes, well. Yes, yes, we like that uh, that Spanish uh, influence. Yeah. Um, anyway, Natsumi's been around for a while too in our group, and also was coming to our events uh, early on, yeah. and uh, is now living a glamorous life. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna look at that video now. Yeah, let's check it out. Okay. Okay, for our interview now we have Natsumi. Hola, Natsumi. ¿Cómo estás? Hello, Jordan. How are you guys? I'm good. <laughs> good, good. We are really happy to see you, which is one of the, our uh, fabulous guests from the Walk Party. Yes. <laughs> yes, actually, it's really nice to see you again, guys, after all this craziness with the corona crisis. But, well, it, even if it's over the phone or even this uh, conversation, uh, it's great yeah. to see you again after a long time. Yeah, it's very nice to see you. You're looking fabulous, as usual. Oh, we wouldn't expect anything. Yeah, anything less. Yes. <laughs> I'm to look like this for all of you guys. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we uh, like to highlight different uh, people on our podcast from different stories because in our group we have so many stories and they are all pretty amazing yeah. in itself. Yeah. Um, so maybe you want to start uh, by telling us, you know, where are you from? What was your journey? Uh, why did you come to the Netherlands? Those kinds of things. Yes, of course, it's not a problem. Well, I'm Natsumi. I'm from Nicaragua, Latin America. I came to the Netherlands in 2018. Uh, it was a travel for a lot, uh, almost 24 hours traveling because I went through a lot of places before I uh, came here. I came because of a conference, and after that, I just decided to stay here in the Netherlands. Okay, and what do you used to do in your country, next to me? Uh, in my country, I was working in an organization about human rights and LBGT community, so I was the responsible of youth. So I was in touch with a lot of youth people in my country, and I was getting uh, some uh, conversations with them what is about uh, being an LGBTQ plus. And also I was working with HIV people and that was a good job for me because it opened me my mind in a different way because I start to understand the struggles that we as a community uh, has been going through. You know, like it's not just my story. It was also the story of this new generation that start to growing after my generation. What, what is it like for LGBT in your country? Uh, actually, it's really tough because uh, even when we don't go to jail, uh, it's still been a lot of things that my country has to learn because it's difficult when you live in the second poorest country in Latin America, you know? So people is not well educated to understand in a good way what is being uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans. So it was like very difficult for me and it's still difficult for the new generation, but we are doing the best that we can to try to teach the new generation that everything everything is okay and doesn't matter if you're different. Right. Now to me, do you have any kind of organizations in, in, in Nicaragua that help you yeah. in the process as a transgender, like to, yeah, in your body process and in everything, or you don't have any kind of- Yeah, problem? actually I was working with ADESENI. Uh, in Spanish is Asociación por los Derechos de la Diversidad Sexual Nicaragüense. Uh, the director, Marlene Vivas, and uh, I has been working, well, I was working with her for around three or four years before I came here. But yes, there is a lot of other organizations for trans community and LGBT people. Do you think that it's more, if you're talking about the letters LGBT, I plus, whatever, that trans is probably the most challenging because uh, mostly gay people or lesbian people could try to hide it, um, but uh, some of being trans is also very much on the outside. So do you think that that creates more of a challenge? 
For me, when I say LGBTIQ+, plus, is because I want to involve the entire community because I don't want to just be focused on me just because I'm a trans woman as well. Because as a community, I think that we have to work as a team, you know, because each month is much better like if we do it by ourselves. So for me, it's really important. And of course, for the trans community, it's even more or the worst part that we receive because we are always on the spotlight. It's something that we cannot hide. And if we hide it, we are hurting ourselves because we are not living our true self. So it's really difficult. And I was living a lot of harassment in my country. So it, it's difficult to be a trans woman or a trans man in a society like this, you know? And even in my country, it was the worst part. But I'm happy that when I came here, at least I see there is different people. There is another way. There is a, another kind of view that the Dutch society see us but still being some spots that we have to continue in the fight because it's not easy even if it's in Latin America or an European country. It's still few things that we have to work to they understand us better. I think it's uh, super challenging no matter where you are because I like what I was saying before that it's sometimes you know visual and with with some people it's uh, something you can see as opposed to maybe you think somebody is something uh, it provides a like you're 24 hours a day seven days yeah. a week you are uh, having to deal with discrimination and problems that could happen so I, I always just feel like it's much more and some people is really they see it just like it's something totally weird and it's strange they haven't seen anything that of that in their life so they just think like oh look at that and they will really really like discriminate you a lot like more than a gay or lesbian person for sure yeah next to me yes yeah how totally. much like, your process uh, like your asylum process in the Netherlands after you came here uh, well, my process, my process was a bit hard alone. It was almost like more than two years. It was two years and after that I got it. And well, the process from living, because I was living in four different HCCs. So I was living in Terapol, I was living in Aachen, I was living in Wageningen, and at the end I was living in Ech. So all those changes and live with people that came from other countries with different cultures. Uh, it's a bit shocking at the beginning, but you learn to handle this kind of situation because uh, you have to be strong enough to support it. Because if you're not, you're gonna give up, you're gonna fall down and you will cry a lot. Because I was already crying a lot and I know that for some people, they don't have the, this strength to get over this situation. So it's really difficult. But at the end, you just see the light, you know? Like, and it's really grateful when the residence permit came to you because after all the situation that you were going through, even in the asylum or with other people in there, it was like, finally, you know? This is what I have been fighting for two years to have the light that I was dreaming to have in my country. And here I can make it possible. Not to me, I think that's really important to say that because I remember we used to speak a lot during those years and that there were definitely moments that were really dark and, and difficult and where we thought maybe uh, it wasn't gonna work, you know, like you weren't gonna get the uh, positive. Uh, that it's important for the people that watch this that are in that process like to know there's hope and that you know you just have to stay strong and keep pushing and you know things could turn out great look at you on your couch in your own house yes yeah I mean we don't want to sound like a cliche but people stay positive that's the advice that I can give to you even if you think you cannot get it you will if you really want it because for me, it was like that. I received a negative decision and after a week, I received a 
the letter that I was going to court, but I was like, I, I mean, I was really depressed. I was crying a lot, but even when I was like under the ground, you know, I was trying to have this strength enough to get new proof to give it to my lawyer and my lawyer to send it to the IND. And that's what I did. Even when I was under the press, I was pushing myself harder to get new documents. And when I got them, the IND can sell my court one day before. So I think this is important that you know, even if you think you cannot get it, you never give up, try to, try to find a, as much as possible documents that you can and send them to your lawyer. That's the most important. With a, with a good communication with your lawyer and you uh, don't giving up every time, that's the best thing that you can do. Yes, absolutely. I, th I really think it's the, you need to keep it strong, no matter what, because to come to a new, co I, all of my respect to everyone who came to this country and, and try to get a new life and everything because it's super tough and we all need to, that's why we are here to support each other, right? Yeah, I think uh, much of what I uh, experienced with the IND is that the strongest survive, you know? You have to keep pushing and pushing and until you think you can't give any more, you have to give still more because uh, in the end, I think also we're a small country, we cannot take everybody, it, it's yeah. impossible, but the people who really deserve to be here, yes, they should be here and- uh, yeah. That's true. And that's why these kind of things like this podcast is really important because we can hear the other stories and we can share some kind of information or we can give some advices to the new ones that are coming to the, to the asylum procedure or the ones that I'm still waiting, you know, because it's really stressful. And you have to hear sometimes these kind of things to give you like the push that you need most of the time. Yes, I agree. Is there any special advice you would have for uh, someone who's trans, who's just coming to this country? Like uh, anything that you learned from, from your time? Yes, the most important that you have to do is create a network. Even if you don't know anything about the LGBT associations here, you must ask because every COA needs and must give you this information. So if you feel lost or if you feel that you're new and you want to have a new network, you can ask to COA always, or you can search on the internet or in Facebook, or if you have another friend that came before you, you can ask that friend and that friend can give you advice because actually the reading here in the Netherlands is huge, you know? So that's the most important, I think. <laughs> True, and I think somebody that might have helped you a lot as uh, we also have on the show today was Alejandra, uh, and yes. I, uh, you know, you guys really connected. Yes, actually, I met Alejandra in 2018 because she was already at the conference with Trans United. That in that period was Trans United Amsterdam, and now is Trans United Europe. It's a huge and big uh, family from trans community here in Europe and in the Netherlands. So I was in touch with Alejandra because I met Dina, uh, the, the, the people that is in charge of this organization. So I was in contact with Dina, with Samira, and after that with Alejandra. So I created my network with uh, the three of them and after that I was just asking, asking, asking what can I do to which people I can talk and these kind of things. Yeah, as I, I remember we really were able to see you grow from yeah. when you came here to this amazing Everything. diva that we see now. Yeah. You know, I'm still, re I'm still remember the first time that I came to the COC Eindhoven, the first party I went there and yes, you can tell me actually the huge yeah. change. Yeah. So, do, do you have you, any uh, help with your process as a trans here after you got your status? Would you have some help or something, organization support? Uh, well, uh, after you get your residence, you can already, uh, well, even in the, in the asylum procedure before you get your residence, you can ask for the hormone treatment at the HACEA. It's not a problem. You ask them, you'll 
need to let them know that you're a trans woman or a trans man and you want to go through the hormone therapy and they will ask you a few questions and after that they can say yes we can give you this and when you get your residence uh, you go to the uh, waiting list to the trans clinic in Amsterdam and this clinic is to get uh, the breast surgery or the reassignment surgery if you want it which is really nice because you are with the specialist. It's not just like a general doctor. So you get really, really good care with the hormone therapy in here. But it's not a problem even if you are a refugee. I mean, I, I just, uh, just because I'm curious and I think I know the answer, but that is covered by your insurance? Uh, actually here, if you go to the trans clinic, that's for free. You don't have to pay anything. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, that's really yes, good. That's because I know that most of the trans community, we suffer from transgender dysphor uh, dysphoria, gender dysphoria. Uh, so it's really good to know these kind of things because you don't have to pay anything if you want a surgery. But of course, you have to be on a waiting list. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, free is better than... Yeah, than yeah. nothing. Actually, in, in, in <laughs> South America, as we know, it's very expensive, also very difficult. You never know what's going to be. So here you will, one day you will get it. And I'm really glad to hear that, that the transgender yeah. people has that help here. Yeah. Yes, that, it's really nice. But of course, everything here is a process, you know. So you have to get used to it, to be on a waiting list every time. So if you're patient, you will get whatever you want. But if you don't, well, it's a kind of difficult. Yeah. I, know, I know that say that you have to be patient after the asylum procedure, uh, asylum procedure is like, um, but another waiting list, well, yes. It's like that because we are in a bureaucratic country and most of the time things work like that. And I think it's much better. Well, I, uh, I like to leave things on a high note. I think that um, I'm so glad to see where you've landed because, you know, like I said, we went through the last few years with you and it was a lot of ups and downs and yeah, and endless patience and, and, and you know, uh, yeah. to see that you got your own house, you're doing well, looking fabulous. Yeah, we um, are really happy to see you like that because from the beginning, we all have this process. We get here. We don't have, we live in the ASSA, we are just there and to see that process is really amazing and it's really nice to show it, yeah. No, and it's really nice to share my own experience with all of you and the entire way that I was, you know, running because you have been with me since the beginning, I think. Yeah. And we were closer to each other actually. So it's really nice to talk about these kind of things with people that I consider myself my friends. Yes, we consider you definitely yes, a friend. for sure. And uh, this is part of the reason I wanted to do this podcast, because we can actually reach people outside of our group as well, because I think a lot of people have no idea what's going on uh, in, in our own country here with this group of people that, you know, we work with. So, yes. Uh, I, I really want to thank you for coming on and sharing your story, because it is also really personal. And, you know, I understand not everybody wants to talk about it. Um, so I really appreciate that. Next well, week. I, I, I really want to thank you guys for inviting me to this podcast. It's really my pleasure to be with you, see you again. And well, I hope my advices and my story can help someone that is maybe outside or didn't start the procedure yet. But I just want that they know that there is hope. Thank so you. So don't give Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Naxumi. Ciao, ciao. Be Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so that was Natsumi. Yeah, it was nice to see her. Yes. And to have a little chat with her because that was also a lot of information for everyone there. I know because uh, I, I, I should say that we never really prepare people uh, ahead of time for the interviews. We want them to be kind of natural yeah. and, uh, and not over-prepared, just so they're more spontaneous. Yeah, and um, that's the I, idea that we are just... Come out. Yeah, but I have to say, I'm really super surprised at all the amazing things that uh, yeah. Natsumi had to say. I'm not surprised how wonderful she looked, yeah. but she had so much. <laughs> she always looks good. She had so much great <laughs> stuff to say. And yeah. uh, what I wanted to highlight about it is hope again, you yeah. know? 
um, you can show how far that she has come. And yeah. uh, that, that I think can be really useful for the people that are still... And for the people who is still ashamed of it. That too. People that maybe feels that they want to be transgender. People who think that is not okay. It's okay. Yeah. And it show it like, it's okay to be transgender. It's okay to be who you are. Exactly. So that's, you should see it and it's an example and never be ashamed of who you are. And that anything is possible. Yeah. You know? So, and more in the Netherlands. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we don't have a lot of time today to talk because we yeah. have such long interviews. But Jordan, by the way, yeah. I want to ask you something. Uh -huh. How did you begin with all of this group? Like, where is the beginning of it? We even never heard that of it. Like, where did it come from? What inspired you to do that? 500 years ago. All right. right. I, was, uh, I saw an ad on Facebook okay. for CUC Eindhoven for the cocktail project for their buddy program okay. and um i thought it was a really great idea cool. uh, and to do volunteer work and also something with lgbt asylum seekers really thought it was amazing because i had just come back from about seven years back and forth to africa to south africa working as a volunteer there no. with kids with hiv um, very interesting yeah it's a whole other oprah show yeah we can talk about that <laughs> um, but uh, this was like something i could do here actually in eindhoven yeah and then i started as a buddy and uh, we had i think six people in the beginning all right and we were super excited that we had that many people <laughs> um, and then what i what i realized quickly was that uh, this group needed a lot more help than just a buddy project and i asked them well what can we do for you And they asked for an event, and then I created a yeah a party kind of the walk-in party. Yes. Which the first one we had 25 or 30. Which we all people. miss. Yes. <laughs> um, so it started from that small group, and then each time each month we did it. It okay. just got bigger and bigger, and at the end it was 400 people. But the thing is that people know me for like as the party guy. Yeah. But in the background, I'm basically. And just, how do you keep like 400 people together, even during this pandemic? Like to keep. To keep it up because yeah it's well what i was going to say is that they know me as the party guy but in the end i'm actually in the background working with people personally every day on their case on problems they experience and yeah. the as it say with the coa with the ind with their lawyer and i think is the personal one-on-one -on -one contact first okay. of all i like that the most yes but it's what's keeping all those three four hundred people no, or five hundred people which is important because Everyone has a different history here. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a different kind of problem. So I guess it's a really yeah, personal work. You don't you just don't share all of that with everyone. No, but maybe it's good for people to know that. You know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, now we have to improvise with this project from the well, beginning. You know? Well, I have to say that people from the group and all of us, we are really grateful about everything, like about any kind of organization or whoever wants to help us or whoever wants to have hair us because it's very important. I mean, like if it wasn't for it, look at the case from the last uh, interview. If it wasn't for it, they will be deported. Oh, there is many cases. This is just one case from many of them. So yeah, it's really nice to talk about as well. <laughs> yeah, I don't really talk about it too much. But uh, maybe it's good to, for people to know that. And actually, brings us to our next video from another organization okay. that we work with all the time, which is LGBT Asylum Support. Okay. And we are going to let Sandra do his uh, update for us. Yeah, always very surprising. So let's see what comes of yes. it. Let's see it. Um, this is uh, five minutes of LGBT Asylum Support. I'm giving you all an update uh, what we are doing at the moment. And in fact, uh, we're working on several things. Um, and one of the things which was also in um, this podcast was about the couple from Trinidad Tobago. Um, they went back into procedure last week um, with more than uh, 30 pages uh, proof from LGBT asylum support, a letter from the lawyer And uh, the good thing is, of course, that they are back in procedure. Um, we got a letter from the junior minister telling us, like, um, she is not responsible to give them uh, the residence. It's up to the IND. So, yeah, I think in the upcoming uh, issues, 
uh, we're going to discuss this every time when uh, there will be something changing. Um, that's my telephone. <laughs> Good. Um, but uh, what is uh, news today is that we are doing a lot of research uh, about the work instruction. And the work instruction is the document from the IND. Uh, the IND, if they uh, have their interviews, they have to follow these instructions how to make questions. And from 2016, we are doing research. 2017, we started with the petition Niet Gay Genoeg, Not Gay Enough. And in 2018, in the House of Parliament, there was a motion that uh, we got enough proof that this whole instruction should be changed. So from that point on, the work instruction changed. It means that words like uh, to accept yourself or the process of how to accept yourself were not allowed to use anymore. But also all the letters you can bring in from your friends, from organizations, they should be uh, taken into consideration because it's very important that the IND uh, shows to the lawyer, shows to the judge how these kind of letters are being used. They are very important. The other thing is what we saw is that uh, in 2019, there was a new work instruction. They added one part to this, which is about LGBT coordinators. At every location from the IND, there needs to be a coordinator for LGBT. It means that the officer from the IND who is going to judge upon your case needs to get in contact with this uh, special officer from the IND. And last year we made already questions to the IND, we got information and we were amazed like, what's going on? Two weeks ago we had court with Hayat and even here at court also the, the judge and we asked to the, to the, to the IND, uh, how is it possible that also in her case there is nothing to be seen in the verdict uh, what the influences of these coordinators. And this is very, very, very important. So today um, we made a, a letter to the junior minister. It went also to the House of Parliament. We want to have a discussion why in all cases who, 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 where the refugee was denied on basis of his or her sexuality, why there is nothing to be found about the contact with this LGBT coordinators. And this is a mistake. This is a mistake by the IND, which we found in this whole system. Because if you go to court, the judge must see how the verdict has been made. And now there is one part of this coordinators, which is just unknown. It is not on paper what they discussed. And that's not allowed to do. So keep us following because in the next episode, we will come back on this and uh, see what the next step will be. Okay, we keep in touch. Stay safe. Okay, so that was Sandro's update for this episode. It's always interesting to see what he's going to say yeah. next uh, because it uh, changes so fast. Every week we have another issue that we have to deal with. It's always something going on. Yeah, so that's kind of the show for today. Okay, I that was, was nice to see our transgender yes, team. <laughs> yes, our transgender power team, Alejandro yes. and Natsumi. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, there are many more of them, by the way. Yes. For the ones that don't know that. Yes. The transgender group is very big. Yes. But we have many more episodes, so we yeah. can bring them all on. <laughs> <laughs> we will. Um, so, I want to remind everyone again that if you want to do a shout out, you can send it to me on WhatsApp. And uh, we want to say that the first uh, five people that send a shout out can win uh, our, our masks. Yeah, I don't they know are over they. here. You can they are really out. nice design. We have many of them though. On the inside? On the inside, oh, that's yeah. not that one. Check it out. Yeah. This one, and we have like a sort of rainbow <laughs> theme going on there. This one also, yes. black. We have different ones. Yes. So the first five people, you'll get a mask. Okay. So it was it? nice. Yes. Thank you for being here again. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> and uh, we'll see everyone on the next episode. Do the do, do we.
Ciao. Hello Jordan and team, this is Amine from Guinea. I have always been happy to be a member of this wonderful LGBT cocktail and event group. Now this video, I send you all my energy to keep company during all your show on your YouTube channel. I also took the opportunity to thank you and your team for all your support. Today I have my stay in Netherlands. It's also thanks to your support. So we want together. I really miss our wonderful party and all the team. Sending to you a virtual, so much virtual hug and uh, too much love. Ciao. Hello dear friends. This is Hans, one of the volunteers of Cocktail Eindhoven. Just a simple message for you. Stay safe, stay healthy, spread love. Enjoy your day. Hey guys, this is Trevor. Um, I finally arrived home after staying a whole night in Viet because the trains was cancelled. Um, I just want to say hi to the COC team and Jordan and everyone that I've missed throughout this whole COVID um, lockdown. Um, I hope to see you guys soon. I hope to see all the new refugees that came. You know, I hope to see all the old ones that I've missed, all my friends, everyone, the laughter, the fun. Um, I wish you all all the best. Um, Take care. Hi guys, greetings to you all. Um, this is Aisha from Dronten. I would like to thank you guys for what you do on Jordan's Cocktail Hour. I'm really looking forward for much more episodes. Um, thank you. Greetings to you from Matthew. I appreciate your effort for what you are doing for the LGBT asylum seekers. You are blessed. You are indeed a great man. Keep it up, your good work. We love you, and I love you. Give us the grace, give us the hope, and give us the pride, because we are all happy to be who we are. Greetings to you once again, and greetings to the entire crew. I can't wait to see the next episode. I love you, we all love you. Yesterday, today, and forever, we will always love you, Jordan, at Great Jordan. One love, much love. Oh. One love, much love. Ha, much love, much love. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us today. We hope you will join us again next time. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel, show us some love in the comments, and share our show with your friends. We really want to thank the COC Limburg team, Petrandus, Mika, Ru, and of course my co host and amiga, Scott and our super special guests, Alejandra and Natsumi. And thanks, of course, Sandro, for the regular update. An extra special thank you to COC Eindhoven Board and Ivar for helping us out once again during this lockdown. Do you have questions, ideas, or comments, a shout out, or do you want to be on the next episode with a talent or to tell your story? Please let us know. WhatsApp 0611209090 or send us an email at cocktail at coclimberg.nl. See you next time.